Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing, and this month we're changing things up a little bit. Usually we would talk about two films, one current and one retrospective, with some connection. It could be the same director, the same actor, or a similar theme. However, a couple of months ago, William and I had a conversation about the movies that made us, or more specifically, the movies that made him the most significant films of his life so far. And we recorded it for our Patreon listeners, but we thought that we would share it a bit more broadly because what was supposed to be a a short 20-minute mini-sode ended up becoming quite a significant 40-minute episode uh, with some really good discussion. William gets a chance to share about the films that are really significant to him, and him and I have a bit of banter back and forth about what those films mean to both of us. So, look, we thought for this month we would put that out there for the wider world, so we hope you enjoy this month's episode of Cinema in Context. Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. And I'm William Chan. And this is another one of our monthly Patreon mini-sodes. Hey. So good to have you with, with the podcast again, William. <laughs> good to be here. It's only been seven or eight years. Uh, this episode is going to be focused on the movies that made us, or rather the movies that made William. Because you went with us when we recorded the episode last year, right? Mm-hmm. I was overseas. Yeah, so Sarah and I, we had a, a good friend of the podcast, Dan, come and join us. Uh, we actually had a different episode planned, but I got COVID. And so wasn't I wasn't able to see the movies. And so we, we had to record online and we came up with a kind of a, a, a callback or a connection to... Um, what's his name? Brett Goldstein's podcast, mm. uh, Films to be Buried With. And so that's where that came from. And you really enjoyed that episode, right? Oh, yeah, I loved it. You were overseas, I'm I'm assuming, listening to it when you were on your travels? Mm -hmm. With the uh, strange tech issues and all. Yes, (laughs) yes, because my my microphone was all over the show. You sounded like a robot, Jeremy, and it was amazing. I don't know what was going on with Zoom at the time, but (laughs) anyways. Uh, And so William listened to it and he said, oh, man, I wish I was there for that episode. And so we've been meaning for a long time to hear from you, William. What are the movies that made you? Awesome. So, uh, yeah, let, let's get into it. Yeah, so let's start with the film that you've seen the most. I think this is a question that uh, you guys struggled with as, as well, because how do you quantify watching movies again and again? I, I, I've thought about what I want to say for this. I thought long and hard about this. Um, really, there's films that you watch in childhood that you can't really say they're the films you watch the most, because what do you know as a kid, right? If if I was to answer honestly, it would be two movies, and that's Jurassic Park and Aladdin. Nice. Because I had those on VHS, and I would just watch them again and again, and again, probably, what, 20, 30 times? I don't know, but they're deeply ingrained in my psyche. And similarly, because um, we, as most 90s kids did, had the entire Disney collection, you know, on VHS, So I've seen those movies just so many times, countless times. Um, If it wasn't for that, it would probably be Independence Day, which we talked about a lot uh, in one of our earliest episodes, comparing Independence Day and that that not very good sequel. Um, And I I love that movie and always go back to it. But I think the movie I want to talk about is is really something quite different. Um, As a kid growing up, a lot of the movies I watched, um, obviously apart from Disney stuff, was... um, I mean, old Chinese and Hong Kong movies. And Jackie Chan, of course, rules that roost. Like, he is such a consummate performer and entertainer that always puts his body on the line and really, really influenced what I like in action movies and in comedies, which is creativity, you know, always a glint in its eye, but doing so for the the benefit of the performer. I I think that's... Sorry, not of the performer, for the audience. And I think that's why I love those Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movies so much because there, there is that same sense of the star like doing everything for the audience and being, are you not entertained? <laughs> um, and so the Jackie Chan movie I think I've seen the most in my life is his 1997 opus, Who Am I? Oh my word! I am uh, this. I cannot believe this is the movie you chose. This is amazing. Really? Yes. I will share my who and my story very quickly. Oh, oh, jump geez. in, please tell us. Oh, I love this. Um, okay, so, so who am I? I saw at the cinemas in Taiwan, and it's one of those film viewings that you it just sticks with you. Uh, something about the atmosphere. It was in um, in uh, central Taipei uh, in a packed 
theater in Simanding, where I, I remember the theaters underground. I was there with my mum and my brother. We had got 7 Eleven hot dogs and snuck them into the theater and munching on hot dogs. And this was the first Jackie Chan movie I've ever seen in cinemas. Uh, back in 97, he was just ever so slightly past his prime. But Who Am I is just this really, really fun movie, kind of proto Jason Bourne in parts, about a special agent, his name is Jackie, uh, who loses his memory during a heist gone wrong, and he's stuck in Africa, and he's trying to figure out A, who am I, and B, what's this big conspiracy around him to do with a, I guess nowadays we'd call it unobtainium, this magic explosive metal that generates lots of electricity, uh, meanwhile being pursued by the CIA. And there are such fun action sequences. They filmed on location in a, a variety of African nations, but also in Amsterdam and Rotterdam. And they use the, the locations, as Jackie is wont to do, to their maximum effect. And mm. using everything to do with the, the cultural um, aspects of those places and incorporating, incorporating them into gags, into action set pieces. There's a scene where he's going around Rotterdam and it's basically a tour of everything Dutch. And you, like using uh, clogs as weapons, he goes down that, that one street in Rotterdam where people are pulling up pianos. Um, and of course it culminates in some of the coolest action sequences where Jackie is just sliding down the side of a skyscraper. Yeah, he's on wires, but that is still terrifying. Yeah. And you watch the making of, and this is one of the movies where he seriously hurt himself as well. Um, and he, he's been you know, airlifted out and he's broken bones. And again, it's just doing so for the entertainment of the audience. And what an entertaining movie this is. So Who Am I is, is probably the, the movie, one of the movies I've seen the most. I love that. Well, makes, what, what's your story, Jeremy? Well, I just, before I say that, it just makes me think of Casino Royale as well. And how there's ah. the opening sequences and... And somewhere in Africa, I believe, mm -hmm. and, and some of the stunt work that's done in that. And I wonder how much they draw from. I feel like they draw from Jackie Chan stuff because the stunts in those James Bond movies are mm -hmm. incredible. I, I remember Jackie Chan jumping through, like, is there a construction sequence in that where he's jumping through a building? Or a yeah, yeah. There, he ends up uh, kind of looping a rope around him and turning himself into a human yo yo. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I watched Who Am I on, a, you know, on TV. It might have been an afternoon or a Friday after evening, you know, interrupted by ads the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I remember just loving the Jackie Chan sequences, but also just the kind of ludicrousness of some of the character beats. When he literally stands on a, on a hill and screams, <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> like the, lo the character logic just really stood out to me. And there's sort of the young female lead, and she kind of has dialogue that, is really incongruent to kind of how humans speak. Oh yeah, um, she, she the, also sounds like a robot. Yeah, and just the whole way that the kind of those moments come together, just as a actually, who am I? I'm CIA. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. I wish more kids would more wish, wish more parents would tell their kids that. Anyways, like just really strange dialogue, but but also having a great time. Is it overdubbed or is it? It's been overdubbed twice. Yeah. So I, I've seen all three versions: the uh, original Cantonese version, the one I watched in the cinemas was the Taiwanese dub. I know there's a Chinese dub as well. So two different Mandarin dubs, as well as the international dub, which is interesting because I think the international distribu uh, distributors thought that the um, the memory loss thing would be pretty confusing with all the edits. So they re-edited it into something that's even more confusing and it's a little bit shorter. Wow. Um, yeah, so there's, I think, at least four different versions of the film. Wow, amazing. <laughs> well, let's move on to the next one. What's, this category is like a film that anyone can enjoy and I, I guess it's a, a movie that you think has enough common common is it common denominators i don't know a film that you you think will, will land in most groups of people that's a really really interesting category i think um whether it be for entertainment value or or educational value or, or just like oh it warms my heart I, I think thinking through this it would have to be for me a brad bird movie right brad bird i i love the guy i think everything he's done apart from tomorrowland is a masterpiece um, he's a guy who, you know, cut his teeth on old Spielberg animated shorts like Family Dog. And then he was one of the writers on Simpsons. He created like Crust of the Clown and, and all that stuff. And to me, my favorite of his works is The Iron Giant from 1999. Um, this is another one that, again, it just sticks out. I, I went to see the Taiwanese premiere of this um, back in 99. 
And so the main kid actor who voiced Hogarth was there. Basically, the, the Iron Giant is the adaptation of Ted Hughes' The Iron Man. Um, and kind of taking the skeleton of that story and expanding it in a way that very much is a critique of 1950s Red Scare. Uh, which is not really something that you see in animated movies, especially animated movies in the tail end of the 90s. I mean, this is when the Disney Renaissance was dying down, and you have exper really experimental works like Tarzan, like like Treasure Planet, um, this thing, uh, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, so mm. stuff that was kind of really trying to go there, because this is when Toy Story had started the CGI revolution. And traditional animated movies wanted to try new things, not always successfully. And I think Iron Giant is firmly in that category. Have you seen Iron Giant, Jeremy? I have, but not like it was, I was a kid or I was a teenager. I don't remember it being the seminal piece that it's now hailed to be, or the cult mm. classic status that it's gained. Right. Kind of attributes to it. So I probably need to go back and rewatch it. I would highly recommend it. It's a very, very mature work, mm. right? It's, it takes its subject matter and tackles it with with very very um like a smart not really revisionist but look back not through rose tinted glasses and for a kids movie like it, it really talks about like the most military industrial complex and like uh nostalgia but also fear and fear mongering by the U u.s government or mm. by government types to try and use the soviet scare to control their citizens meanwhile with the threat of the atomic bomb always almost literally hovering above everyone's heads. Mm. And in the middle of that, it throws a sci-fi story of Hogarth Hughes, this, you know, kind of loner, imaginative kid, and his big robot buddy from Mars. Like, it uses the, the Iron Giant as a metaphor for all of this stuff. And it's it's E.T. meets, I don't know, a whole bunch of Red Scare stuff from the 50s, um, and does so with heart, with verb. The animation is amazing. Um, they do one of the early, I mean, Tarzan did this as well, but kind of mixing in a digital space and a digital character with hand-drawn characters, with Iron Giant, and of, I mean, with Vin Diesel in a very early role providing his voice. And everything is firing on all cylinders in that movie. It's, it's a movie that ends, um, spoilers for the Iron Giant, but it's, it's heartbreaking, but also hopeful. And it does so in a way that is very, very conscious of its central message, which is, you know, I guess what if a weapon had a soul, which is what Brad Bird has been obsessed with through his entire career. The, this idea of government types of, or of action heroes who want to be more than just action heroes. They, mm. they want to find some semblance of meaning or family or, you know, um, of doing good apart from just being a killing machine. And I think... Oh my god, uh, uh, well, in terms of animated movies, I think nothing does it better than The Iron Giant. Wow, I love that. I need to go back and rewatch it because I guess for me, my favorite Brad Bird film is another animated movie, which is The Incredibles. Nice. That, that to me is the greatest adaptation of Watchmen that's ever been made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and exactly all the themes you just alluded to are, yeah, really strongly present. Yeah. Nice. Okay, what film would you suggest to a budding cinephile? So I am going to stick with the animated train from now. I originally thought about any one of Wes Anderson's movies. Um, again, we, we've, we've talked about Wes Anderson nonstop on this podcast before, like cover many of his movies. And I think just the, the, the way he deals with visuals is astounding. But when it comes to visuals and what really hit me as a, as a younger guy, like watching movies and watching more arty movies, the one, the one movie that I think converted me from, oh, just this movie looks great, to I want to know more about how these visuals were constructed and created and artistically you know, came to be, is Le Triplet de Belleville. Wow. Uh, so the, triplets, the Triplets of Belleville? The Triplets of Belleville from 2003. Nice. Um, it is a French, um, I guess, indie animated movie from Sylvain Chaumet, mm. uh, who's since gone on to make some interesting stuff, uh, The Illusionist, um, and some other TV and film stuff. Uh, I mean, how do you describe the plot? It is ostensibly about a budding Tour de, Tour de France like competitor. He's a cyclist. And his old Portuguese grandmother, mm. who trains him to be a super cyclist. Is this one where there's like this slow, really like, you see all the legs, yeah. leg muscles. This and is the one. I've seen this film, but I don't, I'm trying <laughs> to remember what I, trying to think what I remember from it. 
I, I first saw this film at the uh, Auckland International Film Festival. Um, it was projected in the Civic Theatre, so on the big ass screen, and watching it, like, I think it's one of those life changing experiences. It's like, this is, this is what art is, right? It is funny, it's dark, it's meticulously handcrafted, it's clever, it is stupid, it's everything. And I think, you know, in terms of French foreign film, oh, French foreign films, <laughs> in terms of French films, I think this is kind of making fun of what a French film can be as well, mm. because so, so much of the movie is making fun of French culture from a French perspective. Um, the titular triplets are a old kind of like 1920s style cabaret trio. Um, they're three sisters who sing these amazing honky tonk songs with a very, I mean, it's Django Reinhardt. He appears in the movie animated who's playing Django Reinhardt-esque, you know, gypsy jazz. And the soundtrack is incredible. Um, but they end up being roped into helping this grandmother and her son escape from the French mafia. Um, and it's just, it's nonsensical, but it's so much fun. And it is, it is done with the most artistic eye possible. Um, I love this movie. I had the special edition on like a, one of those steel case DVDs and just watched it again and again and again. Um, yeah, The Triplets of Belleville, I think, is a remarkable film. Nice. I also think we, we had a really good conversation uh, in one of our previous minisodes with Doug Dillerman, Sarah's husband, about the kind of state of the film festival, the International Film Festival, the state of the Film Commission. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I, even as you're saying that, about that opportunity to see a movie like The Triplets of Belleville on the civic screen... I, those moments are passing. I don't know how yeah. available they are. And there's something about... I mean, also there's probably something about the age that you were when you saw it, you know, sort of just leaving high school, yeah. um, freshly in the world as a, probably a student. And, and those moments, how much they embed in you and stick with you. And, and you were probably a budding cinephile yourself at the time, right? That's yeah, probably why you're yeah. connecting with that movie. And I think you're absolutely right, Jeremy. Just that, that film... That film going experience where you are in, again, because the Civic, for those of you who don't know, is a one of those grand, you know, art deco theatres. And to be in that and to watch a movie projected cleanly and on the biggest screen possible, I, I think it, it adds a lot to the viewing experience. Um, and you, you see all these grand theatres in the UK and especially in the States being shuttered because there's just no money to keep them going. Yeah. And it's, it's really, really sad. I mean, the good thing about the Civic is that it's a venue for other things as well. Yeah. So in terms of the venue, it should hopefully stay. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm doing a show myself there in a few weeks, nice. which is pretty exciting. But yeah, I know what you mean. One thing I saw, one thing I've seen that's really interesting is the Alice... Um, video store down in Christchurch oh, right. they were able to survive because they transitioned to a cinema so they have little mm. art house cinemas off their various shelves of DVDs and videos which is quite a cool way to see fantastic way to see a movie <laughs> alright what's a movie that you see yourself in that you maybe connect with uh, uh -huh. on a level that is more personal than just being a fan of cinema I think just as you guys had maybe a little bit of problem uh, answering this one, I, I also thought just really, really long throughout the night. I, uh, when, we, um, when you told me that we were doing this episode, uh, I would literally lie, lie awake at night thinking, so what would my pick be? Is it Scott Pilgrim? Maybe Scott Pilgrim. I mean, there's a lot to do with that movie, the Edgar Wright movie from 2010 that really... Uh, it, it was kind of my worldview at that time. Um, I was going through some big changes in life. I was moving to the States. That was the movie I saw with my family the day I moved to the States. And just how that movie tackles fandom and pop culture and how we, as you know, um, the, this generation, see the world via pop culture, I think is amazing. But kind of going back from Scott Program and its use of music and everything, I would say probably my pick is something that uses music in a very, very different way. And this is one of the movies that I had on, on VHS. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I watched ad infinitum, but it was something that is one of my earliest film memories. And I still have such, such fondness for, for everything that it does for cinema, uh, which is Fantasia. Oh, right. like the original. The original wow. Fantasia. Cool. Yeah. Um, what is that, 1940 or 41? Yeah, it's, something like that. 42? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. 
Um, Fantasia, of course, being Walt Disney's big orchestral experiment, right? 1940. Well 40. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so just, you know, after the war started and, and everything's kind of going to custard and you have this American film trying to bring orchestral music to the masses. And it's really interesting because reading like more and more about Walt Disney, the man, he just comes off as a monster, right? He, yes, started off as a creative genius, but as so happens with these people who start a business, which becomes a behemoth. I'm thinking of like the, the Steve Jobs and the Zuckerbergs of the world. Um, how he treated his em employees for quote unquote art is heinous, right? Uh, he would go around like destroying people um, or to make the Walt Disney Corporation the thing it is today. Um, so not a good guy. But <laughs> one, one thing that he did do early in his career was have these aspirations of bringing quote unquote high art to the masses. And Fantasia for, I mean, Fantasia went over budget. It went over time production wise. I lost a heck of a lot of money because when you're in wartime, who wants to watch a, a feature featuring Tchaikovsky and dancing flowers? Like no one, that's who. But I honestly think that part of why I, I love music and animation so much now as an adult is because of watching at the beginning being forced to watch by my mum but then watching Fantasia as a kid and really having emotions about it I was afraid of Fantasia do you remember the dinosaur sequences Jeremy? Uh, uh, no but I remember the battle in the sky the weather sequence is that in Fantasia? Uh, I think I that's, that's in Fantasia 2000 okay okay I remember um, the nymphs and the centaur yeah, sequence yeah that's Fantasia it's a big part of it I don't it's, remember the dinosaurs no the dinosaurs are, um, I mean it's, it's scored uh, by Stravinsky's uh, Rite of Spring mm. and it's about the start of life and then dinosaurs they're not cool dinosaurs the dinosaurs who get eaten, who get killed, who die because they, they're dehydrated in the desert. Like, it's, it's the right of spring being the right of life and the, the harsh reality of living in pre prehistoric times. Um, there's a scene where T-Rex bites a Stegosaurus's neck and throws him around. And as a kid, you're like, but I like dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the centaur sequence you were talking about to Beethoven 6 is so cool. Like, it's, it's this bright, peppy... I mean, it's the pastoral symphony, but taking in Greek mythology, Disney-fied, it's, it's wonderful stuff. Uh, the, the, the images that are coming to mind are of really predatory male centaurs on young female nymphs. Like, it's quite yes. sexual, but in a way that is, it's, it's, it's aggressive. And I remember as a kid being like, oh, I don't like this. This is mm. quite full on. Well, which is interesting you say that, because that's a sequence that's been actually censored several times since right. the 40s. Right. Um, they, they've taken some of the more aggressive stuff out. They've also taken some of the more racist stuff out, because mm. originally there were, uh, let's just say, coloured centaurs mm. doing uh, very, very, I would say, 1940s racist things. Right. Um, I think the, the film works best when it's more abstract. Like, you have... The original sequence, which is Bach's, you know, uh, to, to, Toccata. Uh, toccata. Mm. Um, is that with, with the, the wizard? The wizard the, uh, no, the no. Wizard's so, Apprentice. So, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice is, Sorcerer's is, Apprentice. is with Mickey Mouse. Yeah, it's amazing. With, had incredible stuff. But yeah. the, the, the very, very first sequence is just abstract images, mm. right? So, uh, Disney was, was trying to bring to mind, like, when you listen to classical music, what is going through your head? What images are going through your head? And kind of making that into a visual spectacle. Um, and it's incredible. And for American art to be like that, this is supposed to be for the masses. Like, we've never, ever seen anything like that. Even the sequel, Fantasia 2000, which is some great sequences, is so much more commercial compared to Fantasia 1940. Yeah. Um, and that's not even to talk about Night on Bold Mountain with Mazorsky. Do you remember that one where the demon, it's a demon, right? Chenenborg yeah. wakes up on the mountain and summons the spirits of the dead. Maybe this is what I'm remembering. And it's I'm fusing, horrifying. I'm fusing that sequence and the weather sequence from the new one together. But I right. remember this. Yeah, I remember kind of like arms with claws. Yeah, and, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's naked nymphs dancing before being consumed by flames. This is what I'm remembering. It's, this um, is good. 
uh, like things with with cow scales and the the profane and the arcane, and that sequence is immediately followed up with Ave Maria, um, with pilgrims walking through the haze on a pilgrimage, uh, singing like like uh, about like Christian fervor mm. and about purity, and it's it's such an amazing juxtaposition. So I'm just ranting on about my love of the visuals and the music. You're making me want to go back and rewatch it. I think again, what an incredible piece of art to be created. Yeah. And I think Fantasia is one of those things that it's part of the, the zeitgeist or the cultural kind of consciousness in a way that people maybe don't always recognize. Mm -hmm. And you think about various generations that have engaged in Fantasia, whether as kids or as adults, and it's, it's an amazing piece of work. Yeah. It's, it's hugely influential to the visual cues of Disney as well. Like My good, I mean, straight up the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Right? Yeah. They gave Mickey so much character that he never had before. Yeah. Kind of this cheeky, adventurous, um, you know, getting up to trouble. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> some amazing... And also, I don't think Disney's ever fully done such adult images no. since. No. It's, the, it's kind of the key time that they may be experimented against their core values <laughs> right. and I, I think it was really it was driven by Walt Disney himself because he, he loved classical music and he was certain that this was going to break through mm. and it did it um, it was again a financial and sort of a critical bomb as well and but I mean it did right it was pretty ahead of its time oh yeah 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 <laughs> for like sure it's, it's stayed it's really stayed the test of time mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean again I I just wish I wish in my heart of hearts that the Walt Disney Corporation went back to, to this, this vision. Again, Disney was a terrible guy. He was a terrible businessman and ended up being a terrible creative. But early on in his career, the, 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 the big but, right, um, he had this drive to push these works to a position where, I mean, compare that to what Iger is doing right now. It is really really sad and i would say slightly horrifying uh, we had you know sarah and i and you had in our group chat just the laughing at the images of characters from the little mermaid yeah, read live terrible. action remake yeah you see flounder who's this cute bubbly cartoon character in the original and in the new one he's a fish yeah. right <laughs> he's this photo realistic fish <laughs> like what are we doing we're taking old ip that people love and we're, we're not even refreshing them, we're just remaking them with the barest create, like creative layer on top. We're using the old songs, using the old stuff that people know. And it's just, again, we just talked about the Mario movie. This is IP management, yeah. right? It's, it's making sure that, oh, people, kids will continue to buy lunchboxes with Aero on the cover for another 40 years. Yeah, you're right. And if I think about the, where Disney started, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, that's an incredible piece of my God. art. And like, the, that's terrifying. It, it, it is pushes, absolutely terrifying. pushes the boundaries. <laughs> and, you know, I think about some of my favorite Disney movies that have been flops. Like, I love the Alice in Wonderland film. Mm. Weird out the gate stuff. <laughs> um, if you think about the Sleeping Beauty movie, terrifying yeah. again. Really exciting things going on in that. The, the, Cinderella's really dark. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the cat dies in a puff of dust. Um, <laughs> he goes, Aah! Yeah. Lucifer? Yeah, Lucifer, Lucifer the, the cat. cat. <laughs> That's amazing. Alright, what's your favourite movie of all time, William? Alright, um, I mean, this one is probably a no-brainer if you've listened to this podcast for a while. Um, in 1985, uh, there was a, a kid, um, just a, a, a regular 80s kid, living in California in a little place called Hill Valley. Um, he's best friends with an old scientist for some reason? I don't know why, but anyway, Doc wants to send Marty back to the future. This movie, I mean, you brought it up in, in the, the uh, Prime episode, Jeremy, about your love for Back to the Future. Um, guys, I, I love this movie so much. Like, it is, it's not even comparable to any other. I, I love Star Wars. I've seen the original trilogy on VHS so many times. I've loved the indie Indiana Jones original trilogy so many times. But n none of that compares to my love for the original Back to the Future. I think the sequels are decent. Uh, two and three are really fun as a duology, but I tend to like Back to the Future 1 without all that extra baggage. I think it's just this perfect, weird, sometimes really off-putting sci-fi movie that's, 
the trick, of course, is that it's not really a sci-fi movie. Right, these sci-fi trappings and oh, you know, time machines and DeLoreans and Doc Brown and mind, you know, mind reading devices, but it's really a family drama and a '80s high school gross-out comedy all in one. <laughs> like, it's also a an investigation of the creation of the teenage identity in the '50s, right? And yeah. then the huge disconnect between the, that generation and the '80s generation. Like, there's that. It's really interesting to see what happened in 30 years in the world mm-hmm. between the '50s, '60s, '70s, and the '80s. Right. And so Marty is about. He's really understanding his parents' perspective, but also just how much the parents are ignorant to the experiences of a young '80s yep. kid. Hill Valley, Hill Valley is a mess compared to the 50s version. <laughs> and you're right, it, it, it's, it's using science fiction as a vehicle, haha, um, <laughs> as a vehicle to the coolest vehicle. investigate really big cultural shifts mm-hmm. in, in kind of middle class America. Yeah, which is, again, just the genius of this movie. Like, you don't expect that watching a sci fi. Uh, sci fi comedy in the vein of Ghostbusters, maybe? I mean, this is very much a double feature with Ghostbusters and, and how they tackle very, very different things by using sci-fi trappings. Um, the characters are just so memorable. Like, every single actor is so keyed into their character. I, I cannot imagine anyone else in these roles. I, I don't know if, if you've seen the original test footage with Eric Stoltz yeah, as, as Marty McFly. Yeah. And it's just so off-putting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jennifer has two actors. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and poor, poor Elizabeth Schoen in the first oh, actor. Oh, man. Because they literally just refer to her as the girlfriend. <laughs> uh, you know, it's great. I, I, so my flatmate, she watched all three of them the other day. Oh, like, yeah. literally yesterday, I think. Whoa. The day before, and I walked in and just, I love, I love that. I was talking to people about Back to the Future the night before, so mm-hmm. it seems to be in the, in the, <laughs> in the air at the moment. But... I think two of the most unsung heroes of those movies is um, the brilliant actors, and both of their names have lost me, but Biff and the Mum. Oh, they yeah. They are just, and they get to play so many different versions Tommy of... Tommy Wilson and, um, and uh, uh, Lorraine played by, uh, oh, my bank. Because she's the Mum and Dennis the Menace as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just brilliant, brilliant performances. And... So much fun, and each of them are distinct characters as well. Each of the versions of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's such a joy to watch that. And of course, uh, Chris Van Glover as as uh, George McFly, which it's a huge huge shame that he and the producers kind of had that huge blowing up of of ego and of trust. Yeah, because um, he's so good in the first one. I mean, so it, good. They, they deal with it in a great way in the sequels. But he is, it's a shame that he's not in the sequels. Yeah. My, my, I love the sequels. I actually watched the third film first before any other movie. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. And so I had no context of the hoverboard. And <laughs> so I love the third one because that was my introduction to the world. And right. I love the second one for just like the perfect example of one of the greatest MacGuffins of all time. Mm-hmm. And but I guess my one thing I wished had happened is either they built in the Your Chicken storyline. Oh, yeah, built yeah. Built up to it maybe. Or it was in some way from a germ of an idea in the first movie because mm. it kind of just comes out of the blue in the second movie yeah. to, to really pay off <laughs> it's also needs to pay off Marty's two, two film arc right he needs yeah. an arc for, for, for those sequels third. yeah that's and right and it works for that sense but mm. you're right those second two movies are more of a duology of, yeah. of storytelling and because you know they were filmed together um, they were constructed together uh, Back to the Future 2 also does something that I think more and more films are doing now that we're looking at multiverse stuff. But back... Wait, when was it? When was it? 88? When, when 89 and 90. 89 and 90. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, man, Back to the Future 2 is such a brave sequel. Like, to, to go back to the first movie and to redo it from a different point of view... My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's that, the three acts of that film are great. Let's go yeah. to 2015 yeah. to give people what they want, which is the future. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to spend too long in there. We're just going to use it as a way to then get into this dystopic 1985. Mm-hmm. So we have a reason to go back to 1955, which then sets up an entire third film in the Wild Wild West. That's right. Like it's, it's such an exciting way to think of time travel. Let's go to the past. Let's not think about the future. And I, it's... It's wonderful. Such a good series. Uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, Lorraine is voiced by, uh, is played by Leia Thompson. Leia sorry. Thompson, yes, of course she is. She's, she's, she's so good. And they, they both of those actors with um, Chris. Um, uh, oh my gosh, what's Doc Brown's name? Chris. Chris. Chris Lloyd. Yeah. And um, and 
Michael J. Fox. Mm-hmm. They do all the, the circuits. And yeah. Rightfully so. <laughs> yeah, just the, the thing about the movie is just, and why I like to watch the first one uh, apart from the sequels, is that it's such a clean little story as well. I mean, you talked about it in the last episode of when you, you, you know. The movies that made us. That's right, yeah. about Back to the Future and how you loved it. Like, it's, it's all about setup and payoff, right? All of the first act stuff is just setting up the third act payoffs. And some of it is such efficient screenwriting. The fact that, you know, Jennifer writes her number on the flyer of the Save, save the Clock Tower and Marty just happens to have it in his pocket because that's Jennifer's number and that's how he figures out the lightning. It's like, brilliant. And it's shortcuts, yeah, but it's shortcuts that make sense and it's setting it up in a way that you do not see a setup. Right. Um, you, you talked about already the uh, Lone Pine and Twin Pine more, like little jokes like that, the whole Darth Vader, uh, Star Wars. Oh my gosh. Every little joke in that movie pays off and it's brilliant when it does and it feels so satisfying. And um, they do things as well. I was, I was watching the sequel, you know, when Marty goes to the Ultimate 1985 and he mm-hmm. ends up in his bedroom, which is that poor young girl's bedroom now. Yeah, yeah. It's effectively a recreation of the sequence from the first movie That's where right. he goes back to the barn. There's lots of like repeating motifs and ideas that mm-hmm. they just continue through the entire series. But you're right, that first film is one of the greatest scripts of all time. It, it, like, what is it, Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale? Like, just striking gold. Yeah. Um, yeah. And going back to what, what I said before as well, like, watching it again, I mean, obviously the film is really unsettling in places. Like, like with, with Birth and Lorraine... Um, with all that stuff in 1985 at the beginning where, as you say, Jeremy, it becomes very, very clear that this is a horrible time to live in, right? Rager's in charge. Um, Hill Valley is a mess. There's bums on the street. There's, r- there's just trash everywhere. Whoever did the set dressing is like, yeah, more trash, please. More yeah. trash. <laughs> yeah, let's just color the school. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's really cynical. Right, it, it's kind of looking at the fifties with both rose tinted glasses, but also in a more realistic sense. And like, yeah, uh, uh, that's probably not a smart thing to do because the fifties had their own thing going. Yeah. Um, and of course, the the, the whole thing with um, what's the name, Mayor Wilson, like, like being reelected. Watching it again, it's like, man, that's that's actually really cynical because you meet him in the 50s as this young go-getter who who is like, you know, a colored man will become mayor one day. You you just wait and see, sir. And then when he is mayor, apparently he's doing a terrible job. (laughs) It's like, oh man, but he was so nice. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But yeah, just, and of course, looking back on the 80s scenes when we're 30 years removed from 1985 is heaps of fun as well. And it's like a time capsule of two different eras. Um, I will say, last year I, I had the good fortune of being in, in London and seeing Back to the Future the musical with my family. Um, it, it was written by, by the two Bobs, and a lot of it was scored by Alan Silvestri as well, which, man, his score, mwah, just one of the greatest scores of all time. And not even the theme, but the little, like, thrum, yeah, and, and like the interstitial bits, which, oh man, like, it makes the movie sing. Right, almost literally sometimes, um, but the the uh, musical itself, I think the music is actually really bad. <laughs> um, the songs are so bland. It's like let's make music that sounds like it's from the eighties. Let's make more that sounds like it's from the fifties, and that was that was the spec. But even with that, like the overall core of the story really sung through, and I had a blast watching that. I knew where it was going to go, but at the end where Doc's on the clock and the lightning's about to strike and Marty's being laid out by birth and then he's on the stage playing, you know, Johnny Be Good, like, all of those beats still struck me in a way that I feel every single time watching the movie. And it really goes to show, like, this thing, this thing is, in my opinion, one of the greatest movies of all time and a shining example of... Movies from the 80s which have endured in pop culture because of, or obviously because of the iconography and the, the fact that many people watched it in the 80s when they were very impressionable, but also just because of the quality of everything that went into it, like everything. And what an incredible film this is. Thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. 
If you enjoy our podcast, consider signing up to our Patreon. Cinema and Context patrons receive access to exclusive minisodes, opportunities for one-on-one discussions about films you love, and our extended episode catalogue. Find out more at patreon.com forward slash cinema in context. You can listen to Cinema in Context on SoundCloud, Spotify, Radio Public, Stitcher, Amazon Music, and Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, which are great places to let us know what you think of this episode, as well as give us suggestions for future films to discuss and compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time, and until then, noora mai!